<laughs> well, I'm sorry I didn't say, Lord bless the teachers. The teachers were just let the kids leave. I love our church. I do. You know, it's uh, so many things I could say today about you guys. I'm so proud to be your pastor and be connected with you. I think what I'll say is what I started with last week, and that's out of the book of Philippians 3, 1, where it says, and that's about it, friends. Be glad in God. I don't mind repeating what I have written in earlier letters, and I hope you don't mind hearing it again. Uh, that's how I started last week. We talked about supernatural responses. Today, I want to talk about it again. Uh, part two, supernatural responses. It's so important. And I'd, I'd thrown my wife under the bus and took a little heat for it this week. Amen. As, uh, you know, I, I, what I say? She backed into my truck. She backed into my car. She backed into my son. She backed into my son-in-law's truck with a, in a vehicle that's got a backup camera, little beepers on it. It's got every safety device you can have, and she still hit it. Um, my response was a smile because that's, that's the only way to get through it. Can I get an amen? Now, I know I've done stuff, and she's just smiled back at me, too. So you've got to have and learn this, that when you entered into the kingdom of God, you entered in with a new nature. You entered into a culture as ambassadors from the kingdom of heaven, understanding you were sent here to this earth to discover a purpose, to complete that purpose before your body gives out and your spirit goes on to be with him, to get a new body. These are refreshing statements about the kingdom of God to me because some people, I used to say to myself, well, if you, if you go to your, the church, what, what are you getting out of it? This is a place where you learn, you get revelation, you pick up on things. And if you will apply uh, what I, not only what I'm saying, and I say this with, with much humility, what I'm living. And when I say well, I'm living this, is it just simply means I'm not perfect. I make big mistakes, but I, 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 I stand on these principles. And as life moves on and as struggles happen, I got to remind myself. I told Pastor Mike uh, to, on the way here, the Bible says, reckon yourself dead. Now, that's hard. For 40 years, I've been trying to reckon myself. I mean, you know what I'm saying? When you reckon yourself, it means you don't act like the world does when things happen around you. You learn how to reckon yourself. You cannot offend a dead man. You can't offend him. Amen. You can't make him mad. Now, the word reckon means that every now and then I reckon I ain't. You follow me? I reckon I ain't. I reckon I still act a little in the flesh, but I got to remind myself. Amen. Chris and Tony, thanks for coming out and helping us this week at the ropes course. Amen. Uh, that was a good time to get to know you guys and connect. Life is hard. We do live in a fallen world, and, and sin has tainted so many things, and we see it on the news if you watch that. And so I want to. Re I got to review, and then we'll catch up and finish this message out. But last week we said there is no growth without struggle. You cannot grow unless you struggle. And it's hardest thing for for a parent is to let your kids struggle, let your grandkids struggle. But you know it's necessary. they got to go through the struggles in life. It's the struggles that have made us strong. I look back over my, my, my mom and dad and watch the struggles they had. I didn't see it when I was young, but I saw it as I got older. You know, we, we, had, we had pigs. We slopped pigs. We had chickens. We had roosters. My granny had chickens. And, you know, and, and I remember you, you grew a garden. You had to have a garden. That's how you made extra, amen, if you want anything, you learn how to can stuff. These were struggles to us, you know, at times, but it made us who we were. Today, we don't see that as much, particularly if you live anywhere near a city environment, but to understand growth, amen, the scripture says in Acts 14, 22, through many tribulations, you're going to enter the kingdom of God. If you think life became easy because you got born again, you've lost your cotton picking mind, amen. You got a devil fighting you now, amen. You still got the world against you, and you're still dealing with the flesh that ain't been reckon dead yet. You got to deal with that. And that's why Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 3, share in sufferings as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. To share means I share mine, you share yours. As I was in the hospital to, uh, this week, I was sharing with them. And it, it, uh, you can't go and pray for people without feeling their suffering and pain. 
Amen. My friend Lloyd Barnett this week, a, a bicycle ran out in front of his motorcycle, and he hit it, and he face-planted. It's not life-threatening, amen, but his whole face has to be reconstructed. And I, f I felt that, you know, as a biker, I felt that pain. And I felt the struggles that he's going through it. And knowing it's going to take T-I-M-E to get through this. It's going to take time to get healed up. So we talked about principles last week, amen, that about trials. Because we live in a fallen world, bad things happen to all of us. Why do bad things happen to good people? Keep this in mind. There are no good people. Amen. There are no good people. Jesus didn't come to make uh, good pe uh, bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. Amen. We all, they none of us. Bible said they none of us good. Oh, Pastor, you just didn't know my granny. <laughs> if you'd known my granny, <sighs> you knew my granny. You bought whiskey from my granny. That's right. Amen. So I'm telling you, there's none good. No none. At all, amen? The only thing, I mean, there's good in us is Christ in us. Can I get an amen? But other than that, we, we need help. We have no control over many things that happen to us or those around us. There are times we get called up in the whirlwind of other people's trouble, whether it be neighbors, whether it be storms, whatever happens around us, it happens. Number three, we do not, we do have complete control over how we respond. We call that attitude. Everybody says attitude. Attitude affects altitude. It's how you fly in this life. Attitude is your nose. This right here determines attitude. Take your hand, put it right under your nose. Do it like that. Yeah, uh-huh. So when your attitude goes bad, your hand goes down, which means altitude-wise, you're going to crash. But when your nose stays level too high, you get arrogant. Uh-huh. You get haughty. You spin out of control. Learning to live level in a world that's full of chaos is a powerful thing. To stay level, amen, not to be up and down and up and down to, because it, your attitude affects everything. So one thing or another, this week something's going to happen to you and your attitude, your response to it is going to change everything. Amen. That's how you got to deal with it. Number four, our response to our trials largely determines our spiritual growth or the lack thereof. How you handle it. I, you listen, I have pastored some people 15, 20, 25 years or longer, and they still, when they hear the trial or struggle, they act like they've never heard me preach. I, and now that we got the internet, they just pop on there. They act like they own there, but they're walking around drinking coffee, cleaning the house, listening, every now and then they yell over and say amen to the TV. But they ain't paying attention. They ain't catching it. Are you hearing me? More is caught than taught. You got to catch this thing. You got to get it down inside you and understand to yourself, listen, I got to respond properly here at this moment because if I don't, I'll become a victim. Be a student, not a victim. It's a supernatural response. We're in the book of James chapter 1, verse 2. It says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and lack in anything. One of the things you want your kids to do is grow up. Grow up, please, kid, grow up. Isn't that in your heart? Don't you want to say, make your own bed, make your own way, get your own job, pay your own insurance? Don't you want to say that to your children eventually? Amen. You got to grow up. Amen. You got to keep moving on. You got to mature in life. And yet, we as believers in Christ, it's like God stands up in heaven and goes, Hey, hey, grow up. Count it all joy whenever you're going through trials because those trials are making you more mature. And maturity is a wonderful thing. And during prayer, we go, My God, I don't. Don't know why I'm going through this again. And God says, you ain't figured out why you're going through it again? Because you didn't get it right the other ten times. You didn't respond right. Your attitude. I've never done that in church before. I want y'all to know that right now. Mm-hmm.
So, Pastor, how should we respond to these hard times that are suddenly coming upon us? James says here, he may consider it pure joy. you got to be crazy. The word joy means simply joy, to spin around. It's like a dog trying to catch his tail. It's that excitement in life. And by the way, I'll be honest with you, i got two dogs now. You know, i got a stray that we took in, her name Foxy. And every time I come home now, she jumps on the couch. She is so full of joy. She can't wait to see me. She jumps up on me, and she just hangs out with me. She just wants to be near me that 130 pound male comes in the house he's the same way if you've never had a dog jump up in your face whose head bigger than your head amen that joy they got all oh, day wonderful i love my dogs i can lock them in the trunk take them down the road open up the trunk they jump out with the same joy do the same thing to my wife the translation here of J.B. Phillips says, when all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, my brothers, don't resent them as intruders. Welcome them as friends. And I know that sounds crazy to welcome something like that as a friend. But the bottom line is, if it's a supernatural response. Okay, what am I going to learn through this? What am I going to get out of this? Extended sorrow, we mentioned this several times. It's important to say it again because, again, I see it. I see, I, I see the same people again. I've been pastoring for years struggling with the same thing over and over. They don't, they don't seem to let it go. I have an appreciation for those that understand that sorrow only lasts through the night, but joy comes in the morning. Amen. Count it all joy. When I know that a saint, a friend, a, a family member has gone on to be with Jesus, I count it joy. Amen. It's something about that. I can't, I, I, man, I miss them. You know, I, you know this. If your parent has passed, how many times you wanted to call and talk to them? The advice you wanted to get from them, to hear their voice again. The only way I hear their voice again is to see them later. Amen. That's what David taught us with the death of his child. I, he can't come to me, but one day I'll go back to them. Amen. I'll see them again. I'll see them one more time. So it's important to understand this, this thought here that many of us who make some disappointment, some loss, and when I say loss, it doesn't have to be a loss of someone. It can be a loss of a job. It can be a loss of a relationship. It can be a loss of an animal. I've grieved over my, some of my animals more than I, well, some grief, the excuse for, for shrinking pain and duty, and amen. So we end up, we, we end up falling back into uh, a, a, a life we, we absorb. It's all about ourselves, and it, we, all, we don't help anybody else. you got children. you got people you got to do things for. you got to get back to work. Amen. You can't keep laboring and languishing over the same thing over. You, gotta, you, you can't let sorrow own you. So now we get to the, to the message for, uh, we, we're still moving closer. Pain, James 1. And now, now we're in the rest of the sermon. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. So I have faith in God. I believe God. But God says, hold on now. You, you got faith. Yeah, but that faith needs to be tested. And if you walk through the book of Hebrews, you see over and over the Old Testament saints, their faith was tested. Daniel was in a den of lions. His faith was tested. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow to an idol known as Nebuchadnezzar. And because of that, they were thrown into a furnace full of fire. Their faith was tested. Amen. Elijah's faith was tested as he called the fire down on Mount Carmel. Uh, uh, Elisha's faith was tested. Amen. As he prayed for a child that had died. Over over and over, your faith gets tested as you move through and you endure, and sometimes we just endure. I had a friend used to tell me, well, if you don't get healed, just suffer. There are times that I do just suffer. Amen. I, I struggle in life. But the bottom line is you don't give up. Amen, because my faith now is being tested. Your finances are hit. Gasoline doubled. Your price of food went up. Amen. You found yourself eating bologna instead of steak, but yet you're surviving. Amen. Hey, you just got to learn how to fix it different. Put it on a grill and smoke that baloney. Amen. You, you, you can work this thing. So many of us, we panic because the, the lifestyle we used to have is not there no more. Man, I've gone up, I've gone down, I've gone up, I've gone down. And every time I've done, you know what happened? My faith was tested. Hallelujah. When we started a church years ago, my faith was tested. When we bought this place, faith was tested. Do you think we had the money to buy this place? No, we didn't. We didn't have a million two when we bought the ranch. We had 70 people. First offering was a dollar. A dollar. And I didn't complain. I kept it. Made the people sign it later. Amen. I don't even know if the one that gave it signed it. I don't know for sure. But we've only gone up since. 
But life is about up and down. It, it, it struggles like it. But God says, this is about your faith. Now, every now and then, God says, individually, I want to deal with you. I want to walk you through this issue you're going through in your life. And I want your faith. Because if there's one thing that Satan wants to take from you, it's your faith. Amen. When he looked at Peter, Jesus looked at Peter. He said, Simon Peter, Satan has desired you that he may sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for you. Listen, there ain't nothing like knowing that personally Jesus the Christ, the anointed one, looked at one of his disciples, and he didn't say it to John or James or anyone, but he looked at him and he said, Peter, I prayed for you that your faith fail not. So here he's telling this man that, look, it's your faith that's everything, that belief system inside you that somehow all things are working together for my good. So therefore, when Peter gets incarcerated and goes to jail in the book of Acts, we know that the next morning he's going to lose his head like James has lost his head who stood to faith. Stephen, who was stoned to death, amen, as he stood there, the Bible says Stephen looked up into heaven and he said he saw Jesus sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. He said, God, don't lay this against that charge. What is that, Simon? I mean, uh, uh, Stephen? That's a supernatural response to being beat to death. Amen. So here's Peter in jail after hearing the prayer by the resurrected Jesus. I have prayed for you that your faith fell not. And now in jail, he's sleeping sleeping have you ever slept through trouble i love sleep the older i get matter of fact i'm already planning it for three o'clock this evening <laughs> me and sleep got an appointment hallelujah amen i i, I woke up at four from that dog the little one and never went back to sleep i had to put her out that's the other issue you got with dogs that love you <sighs> Get back over here. He's sleeping. He's sleeping so soundly that when the angel of God comes in and wakes him up and Peter starts to leave, the angel actually tells him, Sir, you're not modest enough. <laughs> I don't know exactly how Peter was sleeping, but he wasn't modest enough to leave the cell. And the angel made him go back in and get some britches on. And the Bible says they walked out of that jail as the sails opened up, and he just walked on through them. <sighs> he gets over to a house that's praying for him. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of them in the room. There's a women's prayer meeting. It was one of them lifts, prayer meeting, ladies in fellowship together, praying, Lord! Jesus, take care of the apostle Peter. Bring Peter. Sir, help him survive. We need to hear his voice again. Bring Pastor Pete back to the house. Amen. And Peter gets to the house after the angel releases him. This is why he needed his britches on. Because he's going to meet a bunch of ladies. Can I get an amen? He gets to the house. He knocks on the door. The Bible says that Rhoda looked out the window. Looked out that little peephole. She looked out that peephole, and hold on, outside the door was what they'd been praying for, mm -hmm. outside the door. You know what she did? She ran back into the prayer meeting, couldn't believe it. She's scared to death. <laughs> she said, ah, Peter's out the door. It can't be Peter. P Peter's in jail. Well, what are we praying for? Amen. The prayer, the, the prayer, my prayers are being answered at the door. Open the door and let your prayer request in. Amen. So that, that was that situation. So faith is such a powerful thing. It's why we're going through what we're going through. It matures us. It grows us up. That word testing refers to the process by which gold ore was purified in order to separate the gold from the dross. Amen. That which wasn't needed. The ore was placed in a furnace, heated until it melted. The dross rose to the surface, was skimmed off, leaving only pure gold. That's a picture of what God is doing in our lives with fiery trials. We all have to undergo some furnace time. Amen. How's it going? In the furnace, man. I'm in the furnace. Sooner or later, though, I'm coming out of here. I'll be a lot better than what I was when I went in. And some of us are going to spend an extended time in the furnace. Some don't take you long to get hot and melt and get rid of the old. Others, it's like every time you see them, how you doing? <laughs> oh, it's hot. 
Amen. Still in the furnace, baby. Still in the furnace trying to figure this thing out. Amen. But the results is pure gold to be like Jesus. Job spoke of it in the book of Job chapter 23, verse 10. If you're country, it's the book of Job. Amen. He knows the way that I take. When he tested me, I will come forth as gold. He knows me. Everybody say he knows me. Amen. Ten children died. His economy stripped from him. His body broke out in disease. His breath stinks. We know that because God left his wife to tell him that. He's having a horrible time. And he says, you know what? He knows me. He knows me, and he knows the way that I take. And when he's testing me, I'll come forth like gold. I, that's what I believe. Amen. Until your faith is put to the test, you never know what you believe until hard times come. Let me tell you this. You can talk about heaven all you want, but you'll discover whether or not you really believe in it when you stand by the casket of somebody you love. Then you know. When you walk up to that deceased earth suit and you say, I'll see you later. I'll see you later. And by the way, you're going to look a lot better later than you do right now. Amen. God's great design is to produce perseverance in us. The Greek word is supomony. It's translated endurance, steadfastness, patience. Do you know the people that you love in life are those that are steadfast, faithful, have patience. They got hupomony, hupomony, however you want to say it. It's one of the first, first Greek words I learned when I was in college. And I, I actually pronounced it hup, hupomony, uh, hupomony, because it sounded better than hupomony. Amen. It just, it did something. You got to have some hupomony. You know what you need? More hupomony. Amen. I'll take the money. No, you need the hupo too. The hupomone, amen. It's a power for it. It describes in the book of Revelation, amen, that f the faith of those brave saints who would not take the mark of the beast. Now, I just say that to you. I love you, but beware of a government or any government that tries to make you take something you don't want, amen, because it sets us up to take something we're not going to want later, and it's coming down the road. I don't know when it's getting here. I just feel people softening up too much. Just be aware of that. Take care of your health, but I'm just telling you, be aware of that. The martyrs for Jesus gain the respect of unbelievers because in the moment of death, they had this quality. To the very end, they died with their faith intact. Of them, it was said, they died singing. They died well. The martyrs, the people who died because of their love for Jesus, those that were disemboweled in the arenas, those that were put inside the Colosseums when wild boars were turned loose on them or lions, those that were wrapped in wax and were burned at night for Nero's pleasure in the city of Rome, amen, who lit the city up with their own bodies, those who died in faith, amen, believe in God that there was something on the other side. Those are the ones we stand on top of. We're standing on them right now. Amen. We're standing on their ashes. We're standing on their memory. Amen. To remind ourselves, it's the little things that we're going through that act like it's wiped our whole world out. Amen. Let me tell you from somebody that started over a few times, you can do it. Amen. You can do it. The promise in James 1, 4, perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I stand on this side of two floods, and I thank God. I drive through properties. I see homes that were devastated, now being rebuilt. Some of them put up a little higher than they once were. And I can tell you this, a resilient people will make it. Can I get an amen? A resilient people will make it. If you learn how to stand and press in and don't give in to despair, I promise you, you're going to make it. There's a process involved in our trials that leads to a product. Amen. Perseverance requires work and faith and hope and dog determination to hold on to our faith, even when the world seems to be disintegrating around us. The great danger is that we will try to short-circuit the process by running away from our problems. The message in, in the Scripture says, don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Amen. You've got, you've got to grow through this. So things known and unknown, I'll start closing with this. First, we can't always know why things happen the way they do. Don't know why. No matter how hard we try to figure things out, there will always be many mysteries in life. The greater the tragedy, the greater will be the mystery. I don't know why. 
Pastor, why did this happen to this child? I do not know why. I learned a long time ago, if I don't have the answer, say it. I don't know why. I don't know why it happened. Amen. It's a, it's a tragedy, but it's a great mystery here to me. Through life, we can look back and see many blanks that we wish we could fill in. Amen. But we can't. Most of the time, we will carry those unfulfilled blanks with us all the way to heaven. I've never wept as hard as I did the day I was in the barn. And Don Nash, my friend, walked up to me, and he said, Carlos Bertagas was murdered on 610 today as a bullet entered into his truck and hit his leg and he bled out. Carlos Bertagas was a young man I met while I was in jail protesting against abortion and stood up and defended me when I thought I was going to get my butt whooped. Amen. He became my friend, my confidant. I'll go to the grave with his stuff. He went to the grave with mine. I have no idea why. He adopted he adopted twin boys. This was known, so I don't mind saying it. At the funeral, his biological daughter showed up from a situation he was in before he got married, and no one knew her. I got to meet her. I got to tell her how much I loved her daddy. Those boys are now 20 years old, <laughs> grown up, David and Jonathan. It's a mystery to me. God, why is my friend gone? Why was he murdered? I don't have the answer. All I know is I got to keep living for God. These are the things we deal with. There, Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things God works for the good. Of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose, if I become a student and not a victim, if I refuse to allow sorrow to own me, then I know that all things are going to work together for good. There's no growth without struggle. There's no growth without struggle. We, it's got to happen. you got to pray and stay. you got to pray and seek God's face. you got to stay. you got to wait. you got to be patient. The choice is ours, natural or supernatural. What is your response when you go through life? Will it be bitterness or will it be joy? Will it be anger or will it be forgiveness? Will it be unbelief or will it be trust? Fear, faith. Hatred, or love. Malice, or kindness. Stubbornness, or gentleness. Mercy, or revenge. Worry, peace. Despair, or hope. It's your call struggle is real. You're going to go through it in life. And these simple principles I shared this morning speaks of your maturity in God, that you grow in Him. God wants, the Bible says He's coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. Pastor Rick Hawkins and I was talking yesterday. Many of you know how close Pastor Rick and I are. He's up in Oklahoma. And he told me about a friend who I knew named Pastor Warren Beamer. He was in his early 50s, and two months ago, going into Baton Rouge, he pastors right outside Bernie, Texas. If you have been on I-10 and you're heading into Bernie, there's a giant cross on the left. Amen. That's Warren Beamer's church. Going into Baton Rouge, he dodged the semi, the back end of the semi, only to hit the back end of another semi, and it took his life. We were talking about Warren's life. And the struggles in life, and Rick had just had Warren's family in and try to help them out and love them. And that Warren had said, said things that one month before he died, one month before he died, he paid his daughter's whole year's rent in South Africa. Three weeks before he died, he made out a will for his wife in, in the church, like a premonition. Amen. Then he passed. I sat back and I look at the brevity of life and, and we begin to talk about the struggles and, and the preparation for leaving this planet. We don't have the answers to why. Don't know why. It's a tragedy. But by faith, by faith, I'll see that LSU loving preacher again. 
Amen. I'll stand and worship with him. This morning you have uh, realized that God wants you to be mature, to grow up, quit questioning so much. Amen. To love those around you, to have a supernatural response. So let me pray with you. We've already asked the Lord to forgive us. We've asked the Lord to heal us. But right now, let's tell God, Lord, we want to be mature in you. We want to grow up. It's, it's time for us to understand that you have put us in a furnace to bring us forth as gold. And until that day that you bring us forth, you'll never quit working on us. And the struggles are real right now. And God, I thank you for this house. In Jesus' name. Let me, let me tell you, as I pause for a second, I know you. I know the people in this house. I've known the struggles that you've struggled with. And I'm saying this like a prophecy. Like I'm prophesying to you that God knows. I know it. I know God knows it. He knows the relational breakups. He knows the, the children that have passed. He knows the hurts you've gone through. He knows the finances you put in things that failed. He knows the betrayals that you've gone through. And the word of the Lord is speaking to you right now that this is mature in you because your attitude is not like that of the world. And there's a shifting in your spirit right now, saith the Lord. There's something taking place inside of you, a maturity like you've never had. We're standing on the edge of some greatness for the body of Christ. And God's saying, come with me. Grow up and come with me, saith the Lord. Amen. Amen. If I get our servant leaders to come up real quick and prep here. Pastor David, I got this. Amen. I'll finish this out. Um, if you need to tie the orphan envelope, it's right there in your pew. Amen. One day you're going to come in here like this place is striped. You'll come in here and there won't be no pews in here. You can do what you want, but I'm going to sit in a chair. You can have your pew. I'll send it to your house. I'll give you all you want. Amen. Father, we thank you for the gift and the giver. Give you a praise for it. Multiply it for the purpose of the kingdom. Amen. Cause people that have never given to understand this is the principle that's going to bring blessing into their lives. Lord, help us to be givers and not just receivers. In Jesus' name, amen. As we give today, we're believing God for? More money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor and success to the kingdom. Amen. We want success to the kingdom. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. I've got a few announcements here that are very important for your church. And let me mention to you.